All right, so um, Dr. Ruben Parra Cardona uh, is associate professor, and I assume he will soon be a full professor. <laughs> no one here will doubt that this is going to happen. And I asked him just a few minutes ago if he was going up for full professor, and he is going up for full professor. So I assume that many of us will write letters. <laughs> uh, and he's a professor, he will soon be a full professor at Steve Hicks School of Social Work and Area Director of Research at the UT Austin, you know, the independent republic of Texas. Um, and he's there at the Latino Research Institute. He's a trainer, he's trained as a, at the master level and also at the PhD level as a family therapist. Um, you know, he's laughing at what I'm saying. We, we, folks who are Latina in the Latinx community, we laugh a lot. But I just want to say that um, I need to emphasize that the Latinx academic community, not just in family therapy, in family science, in psychology, everywhere, in every field, it's quite small. And so I had to say, and, and, and now we are part of that equation of a lot of in which indignity is very present. So I cannot not tell you that he has more than 60 peer review articles. And I say it because often Latinx are in the academic community are undermined every day. So this is why Ruben is wearing a tie. And this is why I took my nice white shirt here because we have to demonstrate that, you know, we're not, we, that it took a lot of effort to get here. So he has more than 60 peer review publications. Ruben is one of the really few Latinx researchers getting federal grants in the family process research agenda. It's being funded by NIMH to investigate the treatment efficacy and relevance of evidence-based parenting interventions culturally adapted for Latino families with young children. He's currently funded by NIDA to extend this line of research to Latino families with adolescent children. In the past, he directed the Gender-Based Violence Research Consortium at Michigan State. He has extensive experience on research collaborations across the US-Mexico border, and now he's the co-principal investigator in a large-scale parenting prevention initiative in Chile. He received an early career award, which is when I met him, at AFTA for his work on cultural adaptation research. This is when I met him for the first time, and he was by P of the Family Process Institute Board, and a key contributor in many of our initiatives to expand our role in the international and transnational arena. Ruben, and I'll say a couple of words, has an infectious optimism and look forward to listen to his talk today looking into the eyes of COVID, probably about looking into the inequity, injustice of COVID. But I think it's nice that <clears throat> he is at the end of today's conference because I think he will provide us with some hints about a different culture. Bienvenido, Ruben. Well, um, good afternoon. Wow, it's a reality that I'm here and I feel so privileged and so excited about being here. And I would like to start by saying thank you. I would like to start saying thank you to the Family Process Institute leadership, for the board, for everybody who was behind making this happen. It's, it's just so beautiful. I think uh, after seeing people little in terms of those Zoom squares, then you realize, oh, Ruben, you don't have hair. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it's just like, or you have three hairs here. It's like, nice to see. Um, it's, just, it's just beautiful because we connect with our humanity. 
Uh, Marianne, thank you so much for the initial conversation about this invitation. When you invited me, I was like, oh my gosh, I mean, it's a tremendous honor for everything that represents all of us being here today. So, thank you. Um, I want to thank the Lori and all the staff who has made this possible. I just love those emails that said, everything is going as planned for in-person. <laughs> Because if we don't have in person, you're going to regret it. I mean, you know the tone of the emails. If you don't have in person, you're going to lose a lot of people. So figure out how you're going to be there. <clears throat> and people have figured it out. Some people uh, driving airplanes. Uh, we have figured out a way to be here. So thank you, Lori, and all the staff, all the tech people back there. Thank you so much. And all the staff at the hotel who's feeding us and the staff who is keeping our rooms clean and comfortable, and uh, the person that opened the doors at night. I arrived at 3 in the morning, and a person greeted me with the most beautiful smile. So thank you to all of you. And I want to thank each and every one of you for being here. I know each of you had some hesitancy, or maybe not, had to accommodate time of your family, personal life, but you're here, and this is what counts. We wouldn't have a community today if it was not because you made the decision to be here. So thank you for that. I'm standing here with you as a Latinx, Latino, Latina person with a lot of uh, privilege. And I use all the names Latinx, Latino, Latina because I do a lot of international work. So you will see me using terms um, in different ways. It resonates with the people in different ways. And I stay here with layers of privilege. I'm a light-skinned Latino, cisgender, male privilege, I'm body able. And I also have the privilege of being a US citizen. And you see this flag, and I'll tell you why is it that um, I'm not running for office. <laughs> but I'll tell you how come I have this flag. I have the tremendous privilege of being a US citizen. And I have the tremendous privilege of being vaccinated, fully vaccinated. And that's a layer of privilege that is here with us to stay forever. And I'll talk more about that. And you see my uh, voice breaking. Uh, when we set up the first doctoral program in Mexico, one of the directors said, and I'm going to introduce Ruben, and I just need to warn you, he cries every time. <laughs> so if you see me tearing up and all that, that that's Ruben. That's Ruben. Oh, here goes Ruben crying again. So nothing new there. As an experiential family therapy, I am extremely overwhelmed with joy by being here at this podium uh, because I am with colleagues, I am with friends, and I am with family. And I miss you so much throughout this pandemic. I miss so much seeing you, hearing you, feeling your energy. Um, I'm so glad we have this podium so you cannot see my legs because I'm also afraid and intimidated and anxious. How come I'm here when we have so many legends, living legends of our field here in this room? So many of the people <clears throat> whom I've read through my graduate studies and now I have the privilege of having the microphone. You, each and every one of you know who I'm talking about, so thank you for being here and thank you for creating this reality for us. And I'm also overwhelmed with uh, joy because I feel love. I feel love in everything that goes associated, those emails, Lori, they came with a lot of love, you know, mama love, but with a lot of love. <laughs> and uh, the talks, the small discussion groups, the laughs we've had, that's all love. And uh, at the end of the day, we do what we do because we believe in love. So I feel that. So for my talk today, I'm going to start with the challenges, the challenges that we have ahead of us. And we've been hearing that uh, throughout this conference, and I will provide my version of that. Then I will move into the importance of having a reflection about continuing to reinvent ourselves, particularly as a result of what we have learned, what we have lived in this pandemic, my talk is more to provide food of thought. I don't have many answers. I have a lot of questions that I will pose for you. And, and I, don't pre I have some answers on the experiences that the journeys we've walked, some lessons learned, but I don't have many answers. 
but I have a lot of questions that I will put for you uh, forward. And I think together as a community is that how we're gonna find a way to keep moving forward. Not in this room, but particularly most importantly when we leave this room and we go to our uh, immediate universe. I'm gonna tell our story. And the most important piece of, out of this talk is I will go through pieces of providing information, but then also the, 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 the sense of community we can continue to create as a result of this uh, uh, 90 minutes that we will be here today. So let me start with uh, that overview. I will start talking about the COVID, how COVID has changed our lives, which is, has been a topic, but also COVID, how uh, we have continued to see oppression in the United States and the world. Um, the title, the title a little bit uh, difficult, uh, soul searching in the family therapy field. I think it's important that I really love the title. It's not about how to think about new paradigms. I think it's about an importance of soul searching. And I think in COVID, that's what a lot of us have been doing, a lot of soul searching. How come I'm alive and my relatives are not? How come I'm alive and my friends are not? How come I can get vaccinated and so many people cannot? And uh, we'll share our journey in our research. Um, it's a very important part of my life, the research, as informed by all my family therapy training. A lot of what you see in our lines of research are, you know, those supervision nights and, and the classes and the colleagues and the people I have met along the way. And then for us to continue to reflect our steps ahead. Virginia Satir said that um, therapy is like uh, a journey in which you get on a ship and the person in charge of the, th the ship is the therapist. And at the beginning of that journey, you know, the joining and all that, you can see the island and what's ahead of you. But it's critical for therapists to, to be very grounded in that process because the process can get intense. Therapy by itself is intense, but with COVID and political times that we have uh, experienced, has been pretty much like this, right? We have pretty much felt like that. Uh, with the political in turmoil, political turmoil that we experienced before COVID-19. And see, the thing is that therapists are experiencing that turmoil as well. It's, it's, it's not anymore those paradigms in which we would go into the session and we would see the family struggle. As we're with families working, we are in that ship. We don't know if we are gonna sink. And for many days during this pandemic, we didn't know if we were gonna sink. We were gonna, we didn't know if we were gonna make it. So that starts right there changing the paradigm for us and the need to reinvent ourselves. I think the process of therapy itself is uh, uh, a process of co-learning. We were talking about diversity. And I think one of the most beautiful experiences we've had throughout all these years is how families continue to challenge us and teach us issues of diversity, privilege, social justice. So the image of uh, a therapist that has complete control of the process, I think this image gives us the notion that we are all in this together. We have certain tools, but we cannot make it if, if we don't have everyone doing their share. So, uh, this journey that I'm gonna talk today is, uh, I already saw some nonverbal reactions, people, so. It starts with the election of President Donald Trump. I was at the uh, Tijuana border. They shut down the, uh, the border, and people uh, start to say Trump was elected, Border Patrol got out, full gear, and they asked us to step out of the cars for 45 minutes. At that moment, I knew how bad it was gonna be. It was a statement of power and privilege, and I knew how bad it was gonna be. And uh, we experienced very traumatizing events. We experienced families being separated, families torn apart, children lost in the system, children being ident unidentified, parents who saw their children being pulled by authorities while well, they were going to a ban to be deported and their children to social services. 
and we experience tremendous, tremendous human rights violations. And then COVID came and we have experienced widespread loss. And this loss has had so many layers, so many expressions. We were uh, facing the new way in very intense ways with our mortality. But not only that, it was intertwined with profound injustice. I always treated the Chinese virus. All of a sudden we see all uh, this lethality of the virus intertwined with histories of inequities and racism and white privilege in multiple manifestations. We start to see these expressions of bigotry and hatred. Stop Asian hate. So pretty much uh, the way we can describe the pandemic is as a devastating pandemic. A devastating pandemic. We cannot minimize the, the description of this pandemic. This uh, uh, publication of the Dallas Morning News, more Latinos, blacks, and we know the complexity of terms, Latino, Latinos, Latinas, Latinx, blacks, African American. I'm going to be referring to many of the sources as they present that more Latinos, blacks dying in the prime of their lives. And that's very tragic, very, 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 very tragic in terms of we were faced with the untold stories, with the untold structures of inequity and injustice that have created this nation. And yes, it's a difficult relationship and I have the pin and I will talk about how come I have the pin. But when you care about a relationship, you engage in that process of honest conversations. And this is a very important, honest conversation that we need to have. During the pandemic, it was very important to reach out to private sources, private foundations doing work that was not on the government surveillance, but that were independent in terms of tracking the impact of the pandemic. And we learned that um, the, the, the hardship faced by uh, diverse populations was brutal. What you see, uh, the gray in, in, oh, sorry. What you see in gray and blue, these are the populations that experience more economic strain, have been unable to pay for basic necessities, blacks and Latinos, whites. Used up for most of their savings, blacks, Latinos, whites, suffer from any economic consequences blacks and Latinos. The same when we look at the different groups that have suffered the most, those with below average income, women, Latino, and blacks. But see, this was a tragedy in the making because this data is from 2008 from the CDC. Back in 2008, we look at the expected years without health insurance. Non-Hispanic white, 7.7 .7 years. We look Asian, 10.9. But look at these dramatic figures. African American, 12.6. Hispanic, 21.7. Expected years without life, uh, without health insurance. Back in 2008, we were not having these conversations as intensely back then. So COVID uncovered deep structures of injustice. Some were created, but deep structures of injustice were uncovered, presented in our faces by COVID. When we look at the risk for COVID-19 infection, hospitalization, and death by race and ethnicity, these are the ratios. We see that the more eleva elevated ratios are American Indian, black, and Latino population. And when we look at death and um, cases disproportionately affect affecting African Americans, we see this map, all that orange in which 
black African American populations are being disproportionately impacted by COVID. This was not something that happened with COVID. This was something that happened over decades since the foundation of this country. Rogelio Sáenz is a wonderful collaborator at UT San Antonio, and he's very precise in the way he presents his epidemiological data. He talks about the evolving devastation of COVID-19 in the Latino community. Evolving devastation. When we look at the ratios of uh, white adjusted death rates, we continue to see people of color most impacted by COVID compared to non-Latino populations. But see, something very tragic is the demo the, the demographics of COVID-19 fatalities. We see older whites dying of COVID, but look at these age ranges, 50 to 54 and less than 50 of people dying of COVID. Tremendous disparities, tremendous disparities. And I think it's so important that when we look at these names, at these numbers, in that 26%, is a man of my age with a whole life ahead of him with the dream of offering a future to his family who didn't have a chance. It's a mother that will not get to read a story to her child because she did not have a chance. So it's so important when we look at these rates, at these numbers, to not stay with the numbers, but to know every one of these digits is a human being. How come we're in this room today and they are not? And we continue to see the groups most affected, and this is another very uh, tragic slide compared to non-Latino whites. We see that the group, groups most affected in disproportionate rates of death rates, again, starts with the group of 25 years of age all the way through 64. So in this pandemic, uh, I lost seven close relatives and friends. And you cannot stop thinking about the faces of those children. You cannot stop thinking about the voices of your friends. You cannot stop thinking about the fact that a week ago you were talking about the plans to go on a vacation. And then they are suddenly taken away from us. And something so important to understand this is the nature of oppression that is so pervasive, profound, invisible, always evolving. Oppression never stops. It evolves, unless we take actions to stop it. And I think COVID brings us back to the foundation of this nation, to slavery, where you have all communities being taken away, being objectified, being used, abused, maltreated, killed. COVID is presented us with the history, with the, with the fight that this country has for its soul. When we experienced the first convictions of police brutality, I know there was a lot of excitement, but inside me I was like, why this long? The United States with all these powerful scientific discoveries, the United States is a fascinating country in terms of so many beautiful things that happen, but also it's a terrifying country when you think about all the violations of human rights. What took us so long? When you hear the president talking about there's good people on the other side, referring to white supremacists and making that legitimate, we are in the fight for the soul of this country. As an immigrant, a lot of what I'm sharing today is my journey as an immigrant. It took, took me 15 years to finally become a naturalized citizen. Me and my family was a very intense journey. And, um, I always knew I wanted to come to the U.S. to pursue my education. So when I was 18 years of age, I uh, was invited to go to a little town in Michigan to be an exchange student. 
And when I was in history lessons, in history classes, I was the only Latino kid in the classroom, and the teacher was saying, well, you know, Mexico, they haven't figured it out. They have a lot of problems. Yeah, we need to be accountable for the challenges we have. But, you know, because they just couldn't figure it out, we just annex territories from Mexico. Ah, I know, right? Annex. Nice. And then they ceded territories. I mean, yeah, in Mexico we are very generous. So uh, we ceded all the green, right? Because, you, we, you know, yeah, you know, that national park and all that, we don't like that stuff. You can have it. Of course not, right? When you grow up in Mexico, you see the invasion, you see the imperialism, you hear all that. Of course, we had our own turmoil. Of course, we had that. But you see how that was taken by blood, by death. And we don't hear those stories. We don't hear those stories. So what we see evolving in the experience, uh, experience of COVID is slavery, is imperialism, that has permeated the history of the United States. And this is where the challenge of the journey gets complicated because I wanted to come to the United States and pursue your citizenship. But you cannot deny that reality. You have to always embrace that reality. Uh, those of you who have heard me talk before, I always show these pictures because uh, it seems it's Nazi Germany in World War II. It's not. It's the US Department of State actively recruiting Mexicans through the Bracero program to prevent this country from collapsing in World War II. So we, we hear so many stories about World War II, but we don't hear the stories of those who prevented the U.S. prosperity from collapsing during that time. So actively the U.S. government recruited thousands and thousands of Mexicans to come and work in the fields, in construction, to keep the country moving while the United States was at war. So when we have these conversations about illegals, they want to come, well, you could benefit from a course in systemic thinking <laughs> by knowing that when you initiate an action, there's going to be a circular process going. So you're talking about thousands of families who initiated a journey initiated by you because you needed us. And of course, when there's economic prosperity, oh, these illegals. They are the burden. But when we go to the store and we want fruits and vegetables, we rarely think about the migrants in the fields still dying of cancer because of pesticides, because the regulatory health conditions are so difficult to pass. We rarely think about those benefits. During COVID, you know, all of a sudden, standing in line two hours to get toilet paper, which is a whole phenomenon by itself, white toilet paper. Uh, how people got so fixated on that. And then uh, fruits, vegetables, and people complaining, oh, look at the quality of this. Look at this. Oh my gosh, are you gonna take those bananas? Are you gonna take those tomatoes? How come they're not doing a better job with that? And I remember standing there with rage, saying, you just don't get it. We have the option of coming here two hours, but we're going to get the food. What the food this, this food is coming is from those fields with those workers who are exposed to COVID, who cannot stop working because they need to feed their families, and they're going to die. And when we see those elevated death rates, and when we see our fruits and vegetables, we see the correlation of that. So it was very hard to eat during the pandemic because questioning where does this food come from? What's the chain that got this food to my plate today? Who's giving up their life so I can eat? During the pandemic, uh, and as we were moving forward in Austin, you have seen a lot of uh, growth in the city, and even before the vaccines, it would break your heart when you would see all the construction workers on the roofs. You would have the white contractors coming to your house, signing the papers, getting the money, and the next day, the crews were all Latinos. 
And despite the tremendous challenge, they would turn on the radio and start working and singing and dancing. And you are just in awe on the sense of resilience that they have. But again, that those expressions of resilience, they get uh, obscured with these dynamics of illegality, not undocumented, illegality, illegal immigrants rather than undocumented immigrants. And that's a perpetual story. We run parenting groups and the most difficult question we have to ask when we start a parenting group is, Ruben, we keep your houses beautiful. We do the landscaping. The meat you get is because of us and our uh, other black and African American workers. The vegetables were there. Why are we hated so much? Why are we hated? In running a parenting group, you just need to sit with that question and with those difficult conversations. Uh, most recently, I got my first sports car. I think the pandemic led me into this middle age crisis. <laughs> and it was like for a long time I wanted to have a sports car. It's a lot of fun. It's a stick shift. Let me tell you. Uh, I can't even buy boom, boom. So uh, I remember my wife was like, okay, how much is the life insurance we have? And, uh, oh, you're covered, don't worry. And, uh, but I was so excited and all that, and I got home and woo, experiencing all that. It was a good deal, used car. You are like, yes, 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 yes. Never buy a new one, used car. And, and uh, so I called my friend, and then my friend says, oh, we build those motors in Chihuahua, the engine you're driving, we do it on a factory. So all of a sudden, that excitement and that magical, wishful thinking, I go back and realize where my car from, where the engine comes, where the cables come. And what you see here is a map of northern Mexico where you have the, the bulk of the manufacture, U.S. manufacturing industry. So growing up in, in Chihuahua, right there, that's my hometown, I grew up with uh, four GM, all the manufacturing city, uh, industries in our city. As you see, we, uh, Ciudad Juarez is one of the largest manufacturing complexes. And, uh, and also food, Nike, Champion. I mean, you just grow up seeing all that around you, particularly in northern Mexico. So when my friend told me, I immediately went back to the living conditions in the northern Mexico, and you see this is a maquiladora industry, a manufacturing com uh, industry, and, and the, the, the skill of the, the Mexican labor is extremely sophisticated. So part is the cheap labor. One of those workers makes $8 per day, right, $8 per day. And also the, the work is extremely, extremely strenuous. There's a say that says, la maquila aniquila, the maquila kills you because of how strenuous that work is. So all of a sudden that excitement about the car and all that, I go back and I see the manufacturing lines and I see the quality of life of families in northern Mexico. And what you see there is a housing complex associated with one of the, the major manufacturing industries. And these are very small houses, you know, you go through college and you have to cope with your neighbor and parties and this and that, that you hear them right here. But you know there's going to be a way that you will have your house. These are, this is it for many families in Mexico. This is the dream of having a house. So you, 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 you see that experience. And you see the profound human rights violations that take place. These are the bosses that many of us in border towns we see like school buses, and what is very dramatic about this is that there are permanent shifts, so you see buses all day, all day long, right? So workers get dropped off at 2 p.m., but also in the middle of the night. And what you see on the right is the faces of women, of the thousands of women who have been murdered, killed in Ciudad Juarez, and who we will never know who did it. 98% of those cases remain unsolved. And it's not a Mexican problem because when you look at the rapists and pedophiles 
they cross the border into Ciudad Juarez because they know of the lack of law enforcement. But we have people, these folks coming from the US, the Europe. And then you start looking at the, how to try and organize crime. And it's not only Mexico, it's international capitals. When you look at those huge buildings in New York City that are empty, you can connect the dots to where the money is flowing. So everything is intertwined. And I wanted to start with the heavy, with the heavy stuff because I think uh, it's essential that we never, never, never forget the foundation of this country, the dilemmas of this country, the soul searching process of this country. And COVID has presented us in our faces many of those structural in injustices. My fear is that, have you seen the movie Awakenings? It's a, it's a powerful movie about um, uh, uh, a retirement house for uh, uh, people with Alzheimer and all of a sudden they have this magic solution to the Alzheimer and they come back from Alzheimer, but then they stop drinking it and then they go back to Alzheimer. And my fear is that we will go back to sleep again. And we will forget those ships with slaves. We will forget the origins of the Bracero program. We will stop thinking about the farm workers who are still exposed to pesticides. We will stop reflecting when I get that fruit and vegetable where that is coming from. When I start my car where that engine is built. When I feel those cables that turn on the lights in my car, where are those assembled? And what's my part in that chain? What am I doing about it? Am I aware? I think COVID provided us with a space of reflection, a window of reflection for that. But my fear is that as many things in this country happen, there will be mechanisms that will make us go back to sleep again. So let me, let me stop here. Uh, so I would like to open it up for some reflections, some thoughts, some questions, anything that comes to mind. I know it's daunting, right? Yes. Thank you, Ruben, so much. Um, what you have been sharing with us, your manner of presentation, touches us on an emotional level. I've just been reading some of the work by those narrative therapists who are trying to connect the brain um, functioning to how narratives change. And they say, say that we have to feel, we have to be moved at an experiential level. And so what I was reflecting on um, as you were closing this part of your presentation was how to, for, for it not to go, for us to stay awake, for us not to go back, how do we help people um, outside this room, those of us who are white and privileged and um, maybe cognitively understand this stuff and care to a certain level, but it doesn't touch us in our soul like you're speaking about. Um, so I just put that out there because I think um, we have to somehow move this to the kind of felt experience that you're providing us today. So, wow. thank you. Thank you, Carmen. Let me, let me sit with that. I, I reflect on our parenting groups, but you're touching on something that is essential and if anybody has a reaction on that, I would love to hear. I need to see with that in terms of how do you get to that place. Thank you, Ruben, for sharing facts with us. And facts are what we have to keep our eyes upon. 
and I just uh, want to share one that I know you know, but it's an important one about my home state of Colorado, which um, came to the U.S. under the, as you know, under the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, and um, it promised that the people who were there, who had been citizens of Mexico, could keep their land, could keep their language, could keep their religion, and within almost milliseconds of that treaty being signed, um, the Salazars were replaced by the Smiths. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a crime. And so these crimes continually happen. They do get erased out of the history books, um, but we are called upon to remember. Um, so I really thank you very much for your running through not just the history, but the current era of this, because it's very important for us. Um, because slavery isn't just something in the past. <laughs> um, whiteness is not something just in the past. White privilege is here right now, and we've been talking about it, but um, you're putting in the human level tragedy of it. And the more we know about this, the more we sh should first feel deeply ashamed, and then second, start fi figuring out what the hell can we do to make this better. Yeah. Thank you for it. Thank you. Ruben, thank you so much. Uh, it's so powerful. And one of the reasons that I think your work resonates so much with me and other people is that you live this. You're close to those people that you talk about and that you care about. It's just not theoretical, but you're in their worlds. One of my favorite writers is Brian Stevenson. Many of you know his work, uh, his book, Just Mercy. And one of the things that he talks about in that book is that proximity is one of the most important things to ending injustice. So putting yourself in those spaces, whether you're there physically or more just mentally and emotionally, I think, uh, is uh, all important, but the way we won't forget about this and move on to the next, uh, you know, cause celeb is to really keep focused on and be proximate to the people that we're working with. So I, when you talk about the situations that you're dealing with, what I have always admired about your work is that you spend time in Mexico, you spend time with poor people, you see what that really is all about. And it's just not theoretical to you, it's meaningful to you in a, in a, in a real way. And I think all of us can have some sort of uh, proximate relationship with people who are in need. And that keeps us uh, uh, clearly aware of what it is we need to do to move forward. Oh, thank you, William. And thank you, it's, uh, you know, it, it keeps me, it keeps me alive, it keeps me energized, it keeps me and many times it's just dealing with the pain and the uncertainty. You know, in Texas, I, and I have the, the, the Steve Hicks because, you know, Texas is a state in the United States, but it's also a planet <laughs> in the solar system, but sometimes we feel it's a solar system within a galaxy. Uh, we're still trying to figure out what Texas is. Uh, but at UT Austin, it's a community of people that is extraordinary and Carmen you know we we shared that in in uh, that proximity that you talk about is so important so as you know uh, we had a horrible snowstorm in Texas well it was a normal no snowstorm for those of you in the Midwest and North but for Texas was like and uh, tremendous uh, layers of economic inequity there but you know people died and all of a sudden, within hours, uh, the roads were completely covered in ice. We couldn't get in and out. I saw the storm coming. I was able to put my family with friends that I know were not going to lose power in an apartment complex because I knew our house was going to be. So for, for a good almost 10 days, right, Carmen? We were completely communicated and uh, no f cell phones, water. I mean, it was horrible. And um, something that is so important for me as a clinician is being with people, as you. And in running one of the parenting groups, 
we're running the parenting groups after the storm, and uh, four mothers in our group said, well, no, we survived, and it was good, but, you know, I lost a lot of weight, and, oh, yeah, I can imagine. Well, yeah, what happened, we work in hotels. And in hotels, the order was nobody in, nobody out. So we were giving every day four bottles of water and two granolas because the food went to the white customers. Austin. Liberal Austin. And that's where you have to sit with that proximity. And... Yeah, I was cold inside my house, but I had food. I knew it was, we were going to make it. I had resources to see how the storm was going to last. But when you think about these mothers, when you think how hungry they were, and that they were seeing other human beings being fed and food being wasted, that's when you question in which world do we live? So thank you for that, because I think proximity is inspiring, is loving, and it's also hurt. And it hurts a lot. But I think if, if we don't keep that proximity, if we stop hurting, that's when we're at risk of going back to sleep. Um, thank you so much, Ruben. I think sitting here listening, I think well, you've done an amazing job getting to is the emotional reality. and the combination, I think, for all of us of being actually actively in touch and not turning away from the atrocities, right? Child separation and access to vaccines, while at the same time holding the shame and the guilt of our privilege and being part of the system, that that combination together, I think, is an incredibly difficult thing mm -hmm. just to be in touch with. It and And, and then, to think about how that doesn't even begin to approximate the pain of the victims of yes. all of this. Like, so all of that together, I think is part of what has allowed me at points to feel paralyzed, right? But we, we can't turn away. We have to own our part of it. And it, it's just a lot, but thank you for bringing that into focus. Thank you, thank you. And it feels, yeah, he feels paralyzing, as you say. Thank you, Ruben. Um, this idea of proximity, um, I think, is very important in the middle of all these conversations because Americans and those of us who live in this country and raising children here do not have proximity to war that majority of countries around the globe had to deal with. No one here, people that have grown up in this country, have seen tanks, have seen body parts on the streets, but they have soldiers that go on the other part of the world, and they have fights, and they see terrible things, and then they come back, and all we can do is clap for them when we are at the airport, and not knowing what they have experienced, even our own, American soldiers, let alone people that have really suffered. And so when you talk about these factories in, in um, other countries that are creating you know, engines and cables and all of that, still there is no proximity to them for American people. Yeah. And this, this discourse about we are the most powerful, the mm -hmm. greatest nation, yes best democracy in yeah. the world. Those are the kind of things that we need to challenge ourselves if we want to do, if we, want, if we want to make a difference. Because lack of proximity in so many different places really has created over the years the United States of America. There is, it's ahistorical because people moved from European countries, immigrated here, and there was no way they could go back and visit their families. So there was this ahistorical, I'm gonna come here, and I'm gonna live here, and I'm gonna be in charge, white people, and then I'm gonna get on those horses and get to so many lands of indigenous people, and then we create capitalism and wealth. And so here we are because of all those 
lack of proximity. And so I'm hoping that, that as you are really getting to that emotional layer of our hearts to, to tell the story of what happens, more and more people, those of us that are listening to you, really engage in those conversations about lack of proximity. So I really appreciate you guys talking about it. Thank you, Manny Jay. And, and I think it's deconstructing these narratives. The United States is the most powerful nation in the world. Yeah, according to GDP, but what's been the price? What's been the structure that started all the way from slavery in these invisible mechanisms that maintain and promote that GDP? So, uh, you know, the financing of uh, counter guerrilla fights in Central and South America in the history of the United States, how many of us know about that? So I think deconstructing this narrative of the most powerful, yes, according to GDP, we see that indicator, but what's behind, what has gotten us there? Uh, what are the lives of people that uh, gave up their lives for those GDP indicators in the most powerful? So thank you, Manny J. So I, I promise I will end with a, a positive note and hopeful. Gonzalo said that I'm a hopeful individual. I am. But I still a little bit more of uh, still have a little bit more of paralysis to do. So uh, yes, we start to see these phenomena that we just could not understand. We start to see these rallies that is not only about white supremacy and and uh, but we start to see these figures we are cute. What is that? And this is something that is so important, and I bring it here to the fore because as family therapists, we will have these in our consulting rooms, in our groups, in our parenting. It's, it's here to stay in for a good chunk of time. And this is a phenomenon that we just cannot walk away. So as you know, QAnon is a, a group that started with these conspiracy theories that there's a group of pedophiles, including President Biden and others that have a underground system to exploit in, uh, children and then get the blood and drink the adenochrome to never age. And we cannot take it with uh, saying, oh, it's a bunch of crazy stuff. It's really impacting families everywhere. And unless we ask, we just will not know. And now you know that family reunions uh, it's very likely that there are going to be debates about conspiracy theories. Uh, COVID-19 is an economic plot against older population. Diseases caused by uh, 5G. Bill Gates funds the pandemic to help his own vaccine. We start to see all sorts of conspiracy theories. A majority of Americans who have heard of the QAnon conspiracy theories uh, consider it is bad for the country, although we see differences according to political orientation. As you can see, more conservative is not as bad compared to more liberal. And the range of what is about conspiracy theories uh, varies, uh, all the way from a general conspiracy theory of control and domination to the more extreme and bizarre narratives that Trump is a savior um, and that child trafficking is being promoted by those in power. Now what is very scary is that it's not something random. We know, and not fighting a conspiracy with another conspiracy, but we have empirical that it's, a, it's, an, organized, it's an organized movement uh, behind which there's people who are focused on permeating this. And what better way of dividing a country than dividing families. And that's what we're experiencing in many families across the United States. We're still seeing family division. And I have a faculty member that is uh, going to retire and he was sharing with me that the worst part of the pandemic were the family fights around vaccination because of the extreme polarizing views associated with that. And they are not in the most extreme realm of the conspiracy, but are in the realm of health practices. So I've been affected by this, uh, experiencing this by relatives I love who are believing in conspiracy theories, by friends, very close friends. And it's a very challenging journey, and you feel like this. You feel lost in that. It's like, where did that come from? At what moment we were overtaken by this? 
But I think uh, it is also essential to never let go of love and compassion because even those who are believing it, and I know this may be challenging to hear, they feel like this as well. It's, it's scary, it's threatening, right? Having that vaccine. For, it took me a while to say this to you. I don't say it lightly. I just was so enraged in the beginning by the whole thing. But the more you try to get into other people's minds who are engulfed by these theories, you start to see how they, how they see the world and how scary it is. You start experiencing self-doubt. You know, in therapy, I process, in my own therapy, I process a lot of this self-doubt I was, I was starting to, to experience. So I had to take a break after Nadine's talk because seeing all of you with face masks and seeing that you go to the hall and you put your face mask was overwhelming to me. Because every day in my family and with friends, I need to fight for that. I need to make a case that we need face masks, that vaccinations are important. And coming with a community that says, you're not going crazy, is challenging. And it's I am one case. We're running parenting groups in which parents over and over in every cohort we're running. We have at least 80% of the families are impacted by this. And again, communities of color, you see most affected by these conspiracy theories as well, which is another way in which oppression perpetuates. This is like this invisible cancer. Very good articles and opinion pieces, Washington Post, New York Times, how QAnon is tearing families apart. I urge you to read this and read this not only by the way in which people are affected, but also by those who are believing it and how scary that world may be. One of the ones that is most profound is by a woman who wrote, I'm dating a conspiracy theorist, but it feels like I'm the one going crazy. She talks about uh, his, uh, her husband moving into conspiracy theories, and she talks about his room darkens, it's late, and it's just the two of us, the smell of incense and Chinese takeout and sheets we haven't washed in weeks. He holds my hand and squeezes. It's been so long since I've sat this close with another person. There's that feeling that everything is collapsing, that somehow I'm the one going crazy, that reality is whatever you want it to be and nothing is at it seems. I look at our hands, the veins in them, I wonder if the stress in them can be struck and ingested, a drug in the blood, like Hunter S. Thompson said, would that really be so strange, so preposterous? In this world, these times, anything's possible. I just don't know. In talking with my therapist, he said, I don't know how to do this. We were not trained for this. Where is in our textbooks? ABC, how to conspiracy theory. <laughs> how many of us in supervision said, oh, we have a month of conspiracy theories and structural family therapy? <laughs> it's very challenging, and it's one of the questions I have for the group, and it's one of the challenges that I put forward to the group, the ways in which the therapeutic work, the clinical work, has been profoundly impacted and will continue to be impacted by this. I see, working in the Latino community, I see the profound impact of vaccination hesitancy, of conspiracy theories, and in running parenting groups is something that we continue to figure out how to address because we do prevention work so we cannot completely derail, but also we cannot minimize the impact of this. So let me move to another topic and then we will start with the uptick. The United States, Manu Jay, as you were mentioning, with the highest GDP nation in the world and mental health disparities. Something incredibly important for us as mental, uh, family therapists is to see the big picture. Uh, in, uh, I got a, a, NIDA, a NIDA grant to, to enhance my training and I chose the path of becoming an epidemiologist to train uh, uh, to be trained as epidemiologist. And the great thing about that was expanding my vision. Uh, I thought I had the systemic vision, 
which I did in the family level, in somewhat family level and community, but the macro picture was very important. So we look at adult prevalence of mental illness across the United States, and you can tell Texas is not doing good. And we look at access to mental health, and we, we see the lack of access. This is worse, the darkened color worse. And when we start thinking about the millions of people who do not have access to mental health, what's our role in that as, men, as family therapists? And I'm not saying we need to close our family therapy rooms and just be in the communities. We need everything. But how is it that we have to expand and reinvent ourselves to significantly address those mental health disparities? When you think as issues such as Medicaid, 95% of parents in our groups are undocumented. We cannot think Medicare, Medicaid, reimbursement, even a sliding scale. We need to generate funds to go to communities, to be there with communities. That's why NIH is so important to me, because it's significant funding, but also we don't have to deal with cooperative agreement stuff in which we will have auditors going through our files, because 95% of our parents are undocumented. So I have to tell our parents, there's 1% probability that we will ever be audited. And if we are, nobody's going to have access to your documentation status. But in being in the richest nation of the world according to GDP, and you see that the basic set of protections do not exist for those who are bringing those fruits and vegetables, who are, for those who are keeping our houses beautiful, as family therapists, what is our role in that? All the beauty, all the richness, all the profound wisdom that we have in our models and interventions, because I love our training and our way of working and changing lives. But when we look at these pictures in which we see millions of people will never have the opportunity to access our services. I remember one father Uh, he would all get, always get all dirt, uh, you know, with dirt in, on his clothes, and he said during the next 12 weeks, we were doing in-person groups in Detroit, during the next uh, 12 weeks, I'm going to be sleeping four hours. I usually sleep six, but because your group lasts two hours, you're taking two out of my Mondays to come here. Uh, but it's a big deal coming here with you. You know what? Because this may be the only time in my life that I'm going to be in front of a doctor who can help me and my family. And you wrestle with that and you say how you're being perceived. But it, I, I think the challenge was how removed he felt from the provision of mental health services. It was a complete different universe. And the fact that somebody with a PhD was in a basement of a church meant so much to him. So that tremendous gap of services, what is our role as family therapist? How is it that we are seeking to address ways to address these pervasive mental health disparities that continue to be present? Our, how is it that insurance-based services, we need to look at those and who is it that, you saw the, the, the figure I presented to you, Hispanics, 21 years of expect, expectancy to have health insurance. If that's the route we go with reimbursement, how is it that we're thinking about provision of services and addressing those mental health disparities? So this is the last tough one slide, and then I will start having some more hopeful slides. <laughs> but making that, before making that transition, um, I would like to hear your reactions to this. In particularly, how is it that you deal with knowing you're part of a system uh, that is not set up in a way to provide mental health services for those who need it the most and have the least? How have you dealt with that? Or just thinking about this, where are you at with that? Any reactions, any thoughts?
Hi again. Hello. <laughs> um, so I, I really appreciate what you've been saying, first of all. I wanted to start with that. Sorry if I'm like up on you, I'm trying to. Um, so what I was thinking was I'm a huge proponent of telemental health, um, and I have come up with some uh, barriers of people who don't like that modality and stuff like that, but um, I feel like we can address some, not all, because you need access to um, technology to be able to utilize it, but I feel like using that modality, in my experience, has successfully overcome some barriers in more rural communities or people who are both working parents and maybe can't make it to the clinic or their kid has like a million other things going on and maybe they can't ride a bus as someone talked about earlier and make it to us and so um, my thoughts are if we expanded available remote services then we might could help overcome some of those mental health disparities that we see. I absolutely, I'm sorry, are you yeah, done? That's <laughs> I absolutely love that coming down. Now we're moving into the territory of hope. And uh, for us, parent training educators, we had these like major, you know, sacred truths, right? That in person is the way to go. And then COVID hits. And then we were forced to do virtual. We've had the best in retention rates we've ever had since we've gone virtual. And you have the parents with the cell phone buying groceries. Okay, let me tell you, how do you do that? And you get all the dizzy, right? Because they're doing their stuff, but they're engaged in session. And then the kid goes through and, oh, you need to remind your kid that this is your special time. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But I mean, low income, undocumented, in Chile, in Mexico, in Austin, we have been blown away by the way in which our retention rates have gone up because people are not concerned about transportation, about food. We do continue to struggle with virtual engagement. Way more difficult to do it virtually than in person because when you have a parent educator who goes to the home and say, hey, I'm not Homeland Security, I'm not in immigration, we're doing this, look at me, blah. you have that personal touch, we continue to, to struggle with that initial engagement. But once we launch the groups, we definitely see the future for our work in, 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 uh, in hybrid models in very profound ways. And now we're running a group. I have people running the group who are in Mexico City, Boston, California, Wisconsin, and we all collide. We all come together Monday nights when we're running parenting groups. Before, we never had that. So I thank you for your comment because I think one of the silver linings of COVID is that it's pushing us to see and to intervene in different ways that for, for years we said that it was not possible. And it's the parents who said, yeah, a couple of in-person meetings, but that's it. Because the virtual thing is that works for me. So thank you for that comment. Okay. Celia. Yeah. Gracias, Ruben. Um, you know, uh, I don't want to take too much time to tell you about what I have been doing now for many years with mental health for the underserved and uninsured. Uh, I do want to say a couple of comments. One, is com I completely agree that telehealth uh, it brings up new resources. At the same time, for a very underserved community, many are, have cyber lag, many, many don't have computers or even smartphones. And so in our clinic, what we have done is actually applied for a grant uh, to provide tablets uh, and to provide IT help Know, so that people can connect with us. And, and we also do a lot of just simply telephone therapy. Uh, but I just want to mention, I think, another issue that comes actually within the mental health field, uh, not just from only the larger forces that influence the mental health field. And, one, and, that, and that's the concept of stigma. Uh, one of the things that has burdened us a lot in terms of providing services to Latin, to Latino populations is the idea that they don't want the, the services mm -hmm. or they come to one session and they don't come back. Uh, and I do think it's a disservice to think in those terms. I prefer to think a little bit like the movie Hoop Dreams that has, if you build it, they will come. Yeah. Because if you build the right services, they absolutely come. 
and, uh, and they come and they love it and they will bring their families. And so we need to examine what we, need by, what we mean by stigma. Uh, and it's whether we are the ones who are stigmatizing people rather than the other way around. And so I can talk a great deal about it, so I don't wanna take the time. But it, but it does bring a sense of hope if we look at what is it that the population needs. Thank you, Celia. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk about you in a little bit and how grounding everything in culture, because now that you have seen the ship in the storm, I think we need to go to the basics. And I'll talk about the basics, and one of those is la cultura cura, culture heals. How is it that we embrace that? And I really thank you for that, because you're completely right. In um, our project in Chile, I'm s thank you for highlighting the piece of accessibility. The private foundation who funded that facilitated all the IT support. So. Uh, yes, it's essential that families that don't have the resource, you generate the resources for them to have access to that. Once they have access, that's what we have learned, that it's really fascinating how they, they want that. And the layers of stigma, we have so much to uncover, and that's where I think really working hand in hand with communities to deconstruct that stigma with community leaders who have a voice that we cannot bring, but it's the community. Well, I'll, I'll keep addressing that, Celia. Thank you. Thank you, Ruben. You make me cry. <laughs> um, I teach in a clinical uh, PhD program in psychology, and uh, the training part of this it can be very vexing. Uh, I'm in a program that where I am the one white male. Uh, we have lots of students of color. We have a, a community frame. Uh, and yet it's still so hard to move our students towards thinking about relationality, uh, uh, multiple levels of intervention, working within the community even though they come with hearts wanting to do that. What it tells me is there's such powerful force out there pushing people towards an individualistic frame all yeah. the time. And it's a struggle every day to move people away from that. And I think, right, a lot of it has to do with proximity to people who, and systems uh, that uh, you, you, you kind of have to wear into it. So I think the training piece of this, helping the next generation move forward, and of course a lot of it is learning from the next generation, <coughs> you know, who are very good at calling me out, is uh, I think both scary but also hopeful part of it. Thanks. And, and you know, thank you because that's where, that's why we need this, you know, this exchange of ideas. I'm presenting here today, but more as a food for thought kind of presentation, sharing a story. But the way we will figure out all this will be by having conversations, by learning from each other and not working in isolation. So I'm very hopeful about what we're here today, but what's next? Uh, with the Family Process Institute, but in our own universes, in terms of how is it that we can continue to create that sense of community to figure that out? Because many of these, uh, these challenges you're presenting are so intense, and the answer will not be in one individual. As l there will be, as, as long as we maintain a sense of community, operate as communities, that's been the only way for me. Ruben, thank you. I'm going to offer uh, uh, another side of this is in our clinic, our university clinic. The university, once everything went down last March and we shut down, within two weeks we had everything with alumni retranslated into Spanish for the teletherapy that the university was requiring. The university said we could only use Zoom and we couldn't do phone therapy and in the state of Alabama. Mm -hmm. um, and so there was a lot of caveats. Um, and, but we started up within two weeks and it was great, but we lost the, the undocumented families who were honestly several therapists who spoke Spanish, their full-time clientele at the, the clinic. And um, I fought hard at the university to bring back in person for that reason. And in August we started in person, we've kept it since, and we have a complete group of undocumented workers and coordinating through churches and the, the lawyers, the immigration lawyers that we started to get to know 
because in the community we're the only center that has reached out and made it possible. So, so sometimes, you know, teletherapy is great. It did not work in the community in terms of, you know, our numbers dropped, wow. plummeted to zero. And wow. then when we came back, the main reason we came back was, and, I, and it was a hard to make that argument, but we made it and we were successful at it. And a huge part of our practice, I have therapists that go through and, and all 100% of their, their practice within our clinic is undocumented workers coming through. So obviously one size doesn't fit all, but it, it, y y I think from us, it is reaching out to the community yes. and coordinating within the community. And it's inspiring what you're talking about. Um, but I wanted to put out this other Absolutely. part, which is there's, Absolutely. you still have to fight the fight and get past obstacle after obstacle. And even now there's different obstacles that we face, that, that we run into, like they, they're gonna move our clinic and they, and they were gonna put me in an area that was more cramped in campus. And I said, what about my clients? And they're like, we gotta think about the faculty, the researchers, and this is a perfect building for the researchers. And I said, but my clients don't have a voice. And my grad students marched on the department head and they're like, clients need a voice. And what about the undocumented clients? And they said, we'll put an armed guard out and they'll put up the arm of the, a gate to let them in. And I was like, You're, then nobody's <laughs> going to show up. And so, <laughs> no, it, yeah. was, it was ludicrous things that they would say to me and I was like, you literally, I, I know you're intelligent, so you must be insane at this point in time. <laughs> but they offer this, and so when you talk about speaking, reasoning to power across the board, I, I, I think that's, that's important to be willing to fight the fight and speak reason to power and, and stay with it and come up with solutions wow. with it. So thank you. No, thank you. It's a wonderful testimony. And I think, you know, going back to that ship in that storm, as long as those inside the ship figure it out what's the best route, that's going to be the way. So I think it's important because it's very risky, right, to fall back again into this is the way. This is the strategy. I think the strategy is going back, restoring that sense of community. Yeah. and figuring that out, which is exactly what you guys did. And it comes in at all layers. Exactly. Like this last time, I was, uh, I was like, we don't have a Spanish speaker. I need a Spanish speaker for the next group because I've got a Spanish speaker. I need somebody coming in. And my colleagues were like, uh, we don't think, we don't have a Spanish speaker among our top, and I guess we do. It's gonna be, I need a Spanish speaker. I absolutely gonna have a, they are the best. And I need a Spanish speaker right now. And the co-leadership with community which yes. is essential. Yes, and, 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 the, and the letters that come back from the churches and the families. I mean, these are people that are brave. People are scared of the system. And they will write a letter and, and thank the, for, for the therapist and send it to, to me saying thank, thanking for what services provided them and taking that up to university. So there's power in the voice of people that have always been forgotten and not felt like they had a voice. And that's where I think uh, in the 15 years that I was pursuing permanent residency and citizenship, I really appreciate when folks said, it's not, we don't need the sympathy of those with privilege, we need their voice and their strength. Because for 15 years I had other people who were my voice because I couldn't be my voice. Evan was my voice. Jay has been my voice when I publish. And people in my department were my voice. And I think what you're talking about is, is exactly that, is that that co-leadership with communities, that the voice is shared. And, 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 and that those holding the privilege engage in the fight, not only provide sympathy. Carmen. Gracias, Ruben. Everything you've been talking about and what we know really highlights the need for trauma-informed care, mm -hmm. right? Like COVID has brought attention to our bodies, our physical selves, but trauma gets embodied every day. And, you know, you were talking about um, Snowvid that we had in Texas. We, we call it Snowvid because mm -hmm. it happened during COVID and there was a big <laughs> snowstorm. Um, yeah. And those are the same people who are also getting sick with COVID, the same people who experienced the war, 
In 2014, in Austin, there was a major storm and 40% of households in that Latino neighborhood lost a pet in that storm. Those are the same people, right? I mean, it's like the trauma is deep and it gets embodied, that threat and that deprivation really gets embodied. And I have these conversations with my husband who is white because I also get all flustered when I see parents and children at my girls' schools not wearing masks. And it's because I have a whole history of threat and deprivation in my life. My family fleeing a war, coming to a different country, being brown, and all of the experiences that I have in my academic life. And so it's not just being upset because they're not wearing masks, it's because it's threatening my survival. Yes, yes, yes. Right, so mm -hmm. how can we build all of that into our interventions and start unpacking, unlayering exactly. all of the levels of trauma? Absolutely, thank you, Carmen, exactly. And, and that's where I think we're at the juncture. Uh, see? You presented this slide. We go back to our title, the needs for soul searching in our field. We need to bring down barriers to service delivery. We need to reinvent the way we reach out. We need to reinvent ourselves as family therapists in this crucial time of history. Really. Thank you. I think one of the ways that we individually and collectively can have an impact is at a higher level or a, uh, a, 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 at a much higher level, and that is at a policy level. Yes. And, um, you know, as a person who used to be in a senator's office, and I was the one who got to hear from mental health professionals when they came to the Hill to lobby for something, I know that if you have people who have passion and who can tell a really powerful story about what it is they want to do, it matters a lot more than just some director of an institute coming in talking about how we can get more pay for uh, marriage and family therapist or whatever. Exactly. And so uh, I, I think that we individually certainly could have an impact by visiting our senators at, at the uh, national level and at the state level, but maybe we collectively as the Family Process Institute could have some sort of a, uh, impact. A again, a lot of the folks who came to see me, APA or AAMFT or the social workers, they were always mostly talking about how do we get more pay for, <laughs> for, our, for our workers, and that's really important. Mm -hmm. But it didn't really ever touch my heart, and I can't ever remember writing any sort of uh, recommendation to do more legislation on that, even though I was part of that process. But when people would come in, I, I just remember uh, a, a woman came in to talk about uh, 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 her husband who was dying of a particular kind of cancer and she told this very sort of human story and she left and I was practically in tears and I went right to the senator and I said we got to do something about that and by the end of the day we had started a, a, a legislative process and so some of the stories that you have told here today and others who are doing a uh, similar kind of work those stories need to be uh, relayed to people in Congress. Now, I know our Congress is really dysfunctional right now, and it was less dysfunctional when I was there, but still there's opportunity to do that at the uh, national level and at the state level, and I would really like to encourage us to think about that uh, as individuals and collectively as an institution. Thank you, William. It's exactly right, and uh, we have five minutes left, right, Lori? Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and it, it's a great uh, way to for me to close this with the hope. Um, I know it was intense on the, on the difficult side, it was important, and the reflections have been great, and that's why I have this map, because my dream is for every family who wants to have access to high quality mental health services to have that. And uh, I, was, I was not able to join you uh, the first day of the conference because I was co-chairing co -chairing a, a conference in my hotel room 
And uh, the new collaborations I have with the National Academy of Sciences are completely pushing me out of my comfort zone and say, if you don't think policy, you're getting nowhere. It's great your treatments, it's great the way you intervene, it's great everything that happens in the moment of interaction, but if you do not alter policy, you are not getting anywhere. You are not having that second order change. So I think that's a charge for the Family Process Institute. That's a charge for the field itself. More people like following your trajectory, Marlene's trajectory of having those uh, experiences in policy. We have to be at the table. I remember when I became an advisor for the health, uh, Department of Health and Human Services, I was in DC and we were allocating $20 million to programs serving um, Latino communities. The majority of people were white. In Ivy League universities talking about us in ways that was completely unrelated to our experiences, that's the moment when I realized I have to be at the table. And I think we have so much to do on the policy realm. So in closing, post-pandemic, kind of post-pandemic, I think I, I, that's the way I feel. I start to see the sun, but the storm is very much there. <laughs> and like, make sure you keep moving to the right. Uh, uh, but it feels pretty much like that. So where do we go from here? I think as long as we don't forget our essential, our core, our basics, we will get through. The way we think about stuff, the way we think about human strategy and pain, our systems thinking, it's going to get us through. As long as we can embrace it, I think we have been too comfortable in the clinical realm, and we're not doing enough system think, thinking and second order change in country level change through policy. The five freedoms of Regina Satir to, he, to see and hear what is here instead of what should be. Reaching out to friends during this pandemic and being impacted by loved ones and friends who believe conspiracy theories and that I can just say how I feel and that friends say, that's horrible. That's traumatic. And hearing that and say, yeah, it is. It's not in my mind. Going back to the basics. Ambiguous loss, right? So much I can say about ambiguous loss. I, have a fr I, still, I still hear the voice of my friend talking to me two months ago. He's here, but he's not here anymore. The institutions we have, the legends we have, how Celia brought to the fore the importance of culture. Looking at the strengths and also the challenges, like we were talking, Celia, the racism in Mexico and the dynamics when you get into that level, as well as the strengths in culture. La cultura cura. Resilience. This is the way to move forward, to look at our strengths to look at what is that we have ahead of us. Social justice. I cannot tell you how proud and how much I miss our meetings in Evanston and Puerto Rico too, thanks to our treasurer who approved that budget. <laughs> but those hard to hard conversations and the initiatives driven for social justice. I remember this conversation that we had in the board about Jay when he put together the idea of uh, writing an editorial on social justice and family therapy when we were at the worst of the Trump administration and how the board was completely behind this. But also how others become vo a voice for us. I remember Evan, dear Evan, I owe you so much because in the beginning of my career, you said, Ruben, say it, say it. You can say it, find your voice. And with Jay, you know, us researchers are a species of human, humanity that believe we're perfect. <laughs> so when we get those reviews by reviewers, we say, how are you there? Don't you see my perfection? <laughs> Jay, where did you get these reviewers who don't get it? <laughs> Ruben, the reviewer is saying this. Oh, <laughs> oh, the reviewer is saying that. And other times how you, Jay, have been my voice 
and have advocated, because you could have turned down a paper and you advocate for those papers. That's a beautiful examples of privilege. So I would like to, to, to end by saying, I have this flag with me today because, as you can tell, I overprepare. I, <laughs> you guys are an amazing group. It's always better to be here. I was going to talk a lot about our studies, but you can read about our studies. The main message I have at the end is I wear this flag because it's been a dream come true becoming a U.S. citizen. And we are in this room today because we hold that privilege, many of us. I don't know your documentation, your citizenship status, but the United States, if something can happen, it can be in this country. And I wear this with pride, with pain as well, for how it came to be, but with pride for what is the future that we have ahead of us, as long as we embrace that future. Just like with that story that you share about the clinic, you embrace that challenge as a community. You provided a voice for everyone involved. So yes, we're still in that storm. Yes, we are still in this post-pandemic. But let's not forget the light we've seen these days, the love we have felt these days, the importance of experiencing experience these days, the testimonies of social justice that we have heard, and that the secret for moving forward is not to be alone, but to be close to each other with hope, with faith, and love. And I want to close by offering a tribute to those of us who are not with us anymore that should be with us. I want to offer a tribute to those who have fought for racial equality, who have given their lives. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by their character. I have a dream today. And with COVID, this particularly touches, I think, about the families we've lost, the friends we've lost, the relatives we've lost. I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead, but it doesn't matter to me now because I've been to the mountaintop. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. And I think about the ones who are not with us anymore that wanted this, to live a long life. Longevity has its place, but I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will, and he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over, and I've seen the promised land. I might not get there with you, and we've seen our loved ones who are not getting there with us. But I want you to know tonight that we, we as people, we will get to the promised land. This is our charge. We don't have the option of not fighting. Not fighting is for those who have privilege. We can only fight, and it's a fight that we have to embrace for those that wanted to see the mountaintop with us, and will not see it physically, but will see it in spirit with us. I want to thank you, dear people, dear friends, for the opportunity to be with you today.